good morning. Welcome to Ohio Rock Talks. This is our second episode. Um, last week we talked about several different fossils around Ohio and this week um, we are going to focus on fossils of Ohio's ancient seas. And uh, yesterday was World Oceans Day if you didn't know. So we thought this would be um, a perfect way to continue the celebration and dig a little deeper into Ohio's unseen oceans. So um, I just want to introduce my awesome co-workers with our uh, Division of Geological Survey. I have with me Chuck Sammons, our Publication and Outreach Supervisor, and Chuck's going to help me with questions today. So folks that are joining us, um, please utilize your Q&A box if you have any questions at all or just want to um, share some comments please let us know in that Q&A box and um, we will ask our presenters any questions that you have. So today I have uh, Mark Peter, our paleontologist, and Erica Danielson, um, a geologist with the Division of Geological Survey. So I'm going to pass it over to Mark who's going to kick it off today and, and he'll um, transition it over to Erica in just a bit. So enjoy. Good morning, everybody. So my name is Mark Peter, and I'm the paleontologist for the Ohio Department of Natural Resources Division of Geological Survey. So we're back again this week to talk about the fossils of Ohio's ancient seas. So if you are uh, walking around in the southwestern part of the state, say down near Cincinnati, uh, you very well may encounter uh, rocks that look like this. And if you look closely at those rocks, you'll see that they're actually full of seashells. So here my pen is pointing towards one of them. <clears throat> this is a brachiopod fossil and the rock is just chock full of them. So you might pose the question is how do we get uh, seashells, so animals that we normally associate with oceans uh, in Ohio, which is uh, today quite far from the nearest ocean. And the answer is that at times in our geologic past, uh, there are a couple of reasons why we had seas in Ohio. And these were shallow seas, not deep oceans. One is that in the past, there were times when the sea levels were much, much higher than they are today. Uh, for example, in the late Ordovician, when these fossils uh, were deposited, uh, the uh, interior of continents were largely flooded with shallow seas. So we had seas that, that came way, way inland. Um, another reason is that hundreds of millions of years ago, the continent that we now call North America uh, underwent a whole bunch of collisions with other continents along its eastern margin. So if you imagine this piece of paper as being the North American continental plate, uh, so we had, you know, collisions with, you know, uh, with other plates and, you know, they would thrust up mountains uh, along about where the Appalachian Mountains are today. And what happened is that the weight of these mountains, and these were tall mountains like the Rockies or even the Himalayas, um, uh, not like the worn down mountains of the Appalachians, but these mountains actually the weight of them actually pressed down and depressed the, um, the rigid crust and the upper part of the mantle. And right on the inside of the mountains, it created a basin. So if you can see that kind of space, when I, when I press down on our continental plate, so my fist would be the mountains and I'm pressing down on the continental plate, there's a space right in here. So like right in here, uh, and that uh, formed a basin, and a geologic basin is basically a low spot where sediments accumulate. So a lot of these are below sea level, but not always, and the sediments are eroding off the mountains. So the, as the rocks erode, 
uh, sediments are shed off the mountains and they accumulate in the basin. And that form the sedimentary rocks that Eric is going to tell us more about. So um, we call a basin like that a foreland basin. And Eric will point it out uh, uh, in her presentation. So now my colleague Erica Danielson uh, is going to give us a basically a little history of the when we had seas in Ohio and the kinds of sedimentary rocks that you find these ancient sea creatures in. So we'll go to Erica. There we go. Okay. Hey everybody. Um, so my name is Erica, I'm a geologist, Vision of Geological Survey. And to start this off, I'm just going to share my screen so I can bring up a PowerPoint here. All right. Oh, wait, wrong one. Sorry. Hold on. Okay. All right. Here we go. Can you guys see that? Okay, great. Um, all right, so uh, today I'll just be telling you a little bit about the geologic history of Ohio and the types of rocks that we find marine fossils in. So, all right, this is not true. There we go. Alrighty, so marine fossils are the remains of organisms that once lived in marine environments. So, of course, like uh, the ocean or inland seas, so saltwater environments. And these are very common in Ohio. You can find them all over the state, um, but particularly in Southwest Ohio. And fossils, all fossils are really important for geologists because they help us break up earth history into different time periods. So this is a time scale that was made um, by artist Ray Troll. And I really like this um, time scale because it shows um, some of the different fossil groups that we use to break up Earth history. So just to break down uh, this diagram a little bit, we have uh, modern day up at the top here. And as we go down through the different time periods of Earth history and through the rock record, they get older and older until we get to the formation of the Earth 4.6 billion years ago. Now this diagram isn't exactly to scale. This part of the diagram encompasses almost 4 billion years of Earth history, while this part here only encompasses about half a billion years, more specifically uh, 541 million years. So this part of the time scale, even though it's less time, it has a lot more detail because that's where most of our fossils are preserved in the rock record. And the reason for that is because at the start of the Cambrian, um, sea creatures, um, they evolved hard parts. So they started to develop shells and skeletons, and those are preserved much better as fossils than soft-bodied organisms that were around before then. So as, um, as all of these organisms started to uh, diversify, and they eventually populated land, starting um, with plants in the very late Silurian, you start to get much bigger forests through the Devonian, Mississippian, and Pennsylvanian. Um, we had dinosaurs um, around during the Mesozoic. And then up in the Pleistocene, we had um, things like mastodons and woolly mammoths that were around during the last ice age. So Ohio's marine fossils, though, um, were all living creatures during the Ordovician through the Pennsylvanian. So the rocks that we find marine fossils in today would have been deposited during uh, these time periods of Earth history. And there, that's about 450 million years ago um, to about 300 million years ago. So our marine fossils encompass about 150 million years of Earth history um, in Ohio. All right, so you might be looking for fossils in Ohio out with your dog, uh, thinking uh, what was Ohio like during the Paleozoic? And to sort of discuss that a little bit, I'm going to bring up some maps of what the Earth might have looked like in the ancient past. So these are called paleogeographic maps, but we're going to start with a map of today. I think we're all pretty familiar with this one. Um, and then here is a map of what the Earth might have looked like during the Cretaceous. Um, so some of the uh, continents, they're still pretty recognizable compared to today. I think you can see most of North America here and South America as well as Africa. Um, we have parts of Europe and Asia over here. 
And here's Antarctica, Australia, and India. Actually. But if we go back to the Ordovician, which would be um, the time when some of uh, Ohio's oldest marine fossils were alive, uh, this is what the Earth might have looked like. So very different from today. And um, Ohio would have been located right around here. So this is an ancient continent that we call Laurentia, um, but this is part of modern day um, upper North America. And like I said, Ohio would be right about here. So the equator would be going straight across the middle of this diagram. So it's actually south of the equator. Now, if we zoom in to that part of Laurentia, I'm gonna just be sort of zoomed in here and we turned this diagram. So here's the equator. North would be moving towards this upper corner, and you can see Ohio outlined in red. Now this is the 30 degree um, south line of latitude, so Ohio is actually at um, tropical latitudes at this time, and you can see on this map that it's covered by water. So here is that Foreland Basin that Mark was talking about. So uh, this is during the late Ordovician, so these mountains would have been called the Taconic Mountains at this time. And we have deep ocean here, we have this deeper inland sea here, and then Ohio is covered by very shallow seas. And they might have looked something like this. So we have lots of different organisms living on the sea floor at this time. And of course, we have um, these very ancient organisms we don't have, um, they aren't all around today, but we do have very similar organisms today, things like corals um, that, um, that would be that today you would also find in tropical environments. So this environment would be something like the modern day Caribbean Sea. If you think of, um, you know, when you're going hanging out on the beach in an area like that, um, you would potentially see corals if you're going snorkeling or scuba diving. Um, the water is gonna be very warm, um, pretty shallow. It's gonna be very clear and sunny. And in environments like that, you get lots of organisms that like to live on the sea floor. Now, this is just sort of one snippet in time during the late Ordovician of what the seafloor might have looked like. But as I was saying earlier, um, the marine fossils in Ohio span over 150 million years of Earth history. So this environment is going to change over that time. And so um, uh, through 150 million years, you could have mountain belts uh, rising and you can have them eroding. Um, continents are gonna move around and sea level is gonna rise and fall a lot. Um, so sometimes this environment could be a lot deeper. Um, it could not be as sunny. Um, there might not, the chemistry might change and there might not be, um, it might not be populated by the same types of organisms. So this is reflected in the rock record. And um, so I wanna talk a little bit about the types of rocks you find in these inland seas. And in an environment like this one that we're looking at here in the late Ordovician, um, this is where a carbonate rocks would be deposited. So carbonate rocks are rocks like your limestones and dolostones or dolomites. And these are made out of calcium carbonate minerals. So minerals like calcite and dolomite. And these are the mineral um, formulas for those. So calcite is your CaCO3. Um, that's your calcium carbonate. And then dolomite is a very similar mineral, but with magnesium in it. And these calcium carbonate minerals are what those organisms living in these shallow seas like to make their shells and skeletons out of. And over time, um, as those organisms reproduce and end up dying, a lot of their skeletons build up on the sea floor. They can end up breaking down or some are preserved very quickly. Um, and over time, those build up, they cement, and maybe compact a little bit and they form limestones or dolostones or dolomites um, like we see today in Ohio. Um, so these are some pictures of some Ohio carbonates. These are actually slurrian rocks. You can still find um, a lot of fossils in these. And um, your carbonate rocks have some of um, the most fossils in them in Ohio. So you can find them usually pretty easily. And um, But they're not the only types of rocks we find fossils in. We also find fossils in our siliciclastic rocks or rocks like shales and siltstones and sandstones. So shales is a picture of shales over here. Um, we also have some shales in this middle picture as well. And these rocks have some of um, are actually great for fossil collecting, especially the shales in the Ordovician, um, because fossils pop out of them really easily compared to carbonate rocks. 
Um, so we can have actually find a lot of fossils in shales during um, certain time periods, but it depended on what that environment was like when those rocks were deposited. So sometimes we get shales with tons of fossils in them, like in the Ordovician, and sometimes we get shales with almost no fossils in them, or very few, um, like in our upper Devonian shales. And that's just because the environment was different at that time, and um, it wasn't um, a really, the sea bottom would have been muddy instead of like that carbonate sea, and we would have had different organisms living in that environment. And so in our upper Devonian shales, instead of finding lots of things like corals and brachiopods and trilobites, we find things like a giant armored fish. And these would have been um, organisms that were swimming around in the water column because um, there wasn't quite as, quite, the, quite as much living on the sea floor in this time. So um, we could also find fossils in things like siltstones um, and sandstones. Um, they're typically rarer um, because, um, especially in sandstones, just because those environments that those rocks form in aren't as friendly for um, organisms to live in. So um, I have seen some fossils in um, like the blackhand sandstone, for instance, but usually they're uh, pretty hard to find. Um, in environments where sandstones form, there's usually a lot of high energy and the sediment's moving around a lot. So it's difficult for um, organisms to live on the seafloor and areas uh, areas like that. Um, so, so we might not see a ton, but you can still find some if you're out in an area where, where there are sandstones. Um, here. Okay, so if you are curious as to what types of rocks and fossils you can find um, around where you're living, um, you can check out a bedrock geologic map of Ohio. So this is a really uh, simplified version where all the colors um, just indicate the age of the rocks at the surface in that area. Um, so our Ordovician and Silurian rocks over here in Western Ohio, um, those have a lot of those carbonate rocks I was talking about with a ton of fossils in them. Um, and then uh, the rocks over here, so your orange are your upper Devonian rocks, this lighter orange, and then your blues are your Mississippian and Pennsylvanian rocks, which still have um, really cool marine fossils in them. They might just be a little harder to find, um, but if you know where, where to look, which Mark should be telling you a little bit about that in our last uh, webinar series on how to collect fossils, um, you can still find some really neat stuff. Alrighty. Uh, anyone has any questions now, I'd be happy to answer them, Melissa. Um, otherwise, we can pass it back to Mark. Um, we do have questions. Um, let's see. So we had uh, someone asked, are these fossils very common in states other than Ohio? And are they especially common in one region, like the Midwest or the Pacific Northwest? Right. Yeah, you can find fossils all over. Um, it just depends on really the geologic history of that area. Um, so the fossils that we find in Ohio, you can find really similar fossils all over the United States, um, especially the eastern part of the US, um, especially in all of like the bordering states to Ohio. Um, so yeah, so it just depends on, like I said, the geologic history of that area, but you can find fossils like this all over the world. Um, and there are two more. So uh, why don't we find fossils after the Pennsylvanian period in Ohio? Right, that's a good question. So um, we actually do have fossils after the Pennsylvanian in Ohio, um, but I focus specifically on time periods when we have marine fossils and definitive um, marine environments were in Ohio during those times. Um, but after the Pennsylvanian, um, we don't find any definitive marine fossils in, in those rocks. Um, so you'll actually hear about some of those fossils next week, um, but a lot of them are actually uh, land plants and fossils. So. Um, it's just a different type of environment at that time. And we also um, most likely had um, other types of environments in Ohio during different time periods. Like we probably had dinosaurs walking around in Ohio, but we just don't have rocks from those time periods preserved here today. So we don't see those types of fossils. Okay. Um, so actually an another question came in. So I guess there's still two more. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, can fossils be found inside of a rock? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so if you're, um, 
if you're talking about um, how like can you crack open a rock and find them, that's definitely when you're looking at like carbonates, sometimes the fossils can actually be really hard to see from the outside because they weather away a lot. So if you crack them open, you can find them easily. Um, you might have heard of like Ohio, the Ohio Shale is a rock formation that's really famous for its concretions. Um, and these are these large spherical um, masses of uh, carbonate minerals. And sometimes they have fossils inside of them too. And so they're sort of famous for that. So you can find fossils in yeah, all different, all different types of rocks. Okay, and um, one viewer, Lori, she wrote in and said, so horned coral, I have several rocks with circular patterns on them. I'm assuming that's the base. I have one actual coral. What period is that? Alrighty, so we have corals from a lot of different um, time periods in Ohio, so they could be Ordovician, Silurian, or Devonian, um, but I'm going to pass the rest of that question over to Mark because he's going to tell you about horn corals. Okay. You're alive now, Mark. Um, I think you're still on mute, though. I do that all the time. <laughs> yep, okay, you can hear me now? Yep. Okay, so what I would do if you want to find out what age those fossils might be is to look at a geologic map like Erica showed us uh, a minute ago that shows the age of the rocks as they uh, occur on the surface. So uh, you can kind of get a good idea of where the age that you might be in if you just, uh, you know, figure out what county you're in and take a look on that map. That, that, that'll be a good starting place. Um, the, the Division of Geological Survey also has a rock identification service where if you take some pictures of your fossils and include something for scale and tell us where you found them, you can uh, email them to us and we'll do our best to help you identify them. Um, okay, and there's another question, if you don't mind me asking before you get started with your second part. Um, was there an extinction between the eras with marine fossils and eras without? Um, generally, the there are generally extinctions uh, at the end of each of those major geologic periods. Uh, that's largely how they're defined. But um, there, there would be local extinctions uh, because the environments are going away. Uh, but whether or not those animals, you know, went extinct somewhere else uh, is 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 a is another question. So, uh, but in in Ohio, those environments would change. So you'll have entirely different organisms, but they might be living uh, somewhere else where that environment is still present. Okay. If that makes sense. Yeah, um, one last one and I'm going to let you get started. Uh, how long does it take for a fossil to form? Ah, that's an, that goes to the definition of a fossil, which we talked about last week. So the fossils are the remains of any organisms that once lived that are preserved in the geologic record. And it gets a little bit uh, squishy when you talk about uh, very, very recent fossils. So even some of, you know, the ones from the last ice ages, um, you know, are these are these fossils or are they just old bones or shells, right? Um, but generally, if they're if they're part of the, you know, the sedimentary rock record, we call them fossils. But there's no sharp line uh, that says, okay, after this date, they're fossils, or, you know, or before this date, they're fossils, and after this date, they're not. Cool. Awesome. Well, I'll let you get started, and I'll, um, we'll ask more questions later on. Okay. Sounds good. So, first of all, uh, I have an activity that um, kids can do uh, almost anywhere in the state. If you have a gravel driveway, uh, you can find fossils because a lot of these gravel driveways are made out of limestone, which was quarried in the western part of Ohio. Uh, and the limestones almost always contain fossils. So if you can find a gravel driveway with limestone in it, 
chances are that you're going to have, you know, the kind of seashell fossils uh, that I'm going to be talking about uh, in just a few minutes. So uh, even if you are in, say, the eastern or southeastern part of the state where there are fewer limestones, chances are there's a gravel driveway somewhere where you could hunt for fossils. So I'm going to start by talking about probably the most conspicuous and some of the most abundant fossils that you'll find in Ohio. The first one I want to talk about are the ones I already held up, and uh, these are called brachiopods. And I made little flashcards, so it, uh, you know sometimes it's hard if I'm saying the word and it, it's nice to know how it's spelled. So I'm going to talk about brachiopods first. So brachiopods have two shells, kind of like the more common or familiar, I should say, bivalves. So, you know, bivalves are, you, you know, you know those as clams and oysters and scallops, you know, they can be very tasty, maybe with some cocktail sauce. Um, brachiopods, on the other hand, you know, probably did not have much meat in them and would not have been very uh, fulfilling. So uh, here's another uh, piece of limestone from southwestern Ohio with some brachiopod shells. And there are thousands and thousands of different kinds of brachiopods. Um, this is one that I found uh, growing up uh, when I was about 10 years old in the creek behind my house uh, down in the Cincinnati area. And you can see it's got two shells that fit together again much like a clam shell, but inside they were very different. And brachiopods had little structures inside called lophophores that they used to filter fine uh, organic particles and plankton from the water. So most brachiopods would sit in one place for most of their life and they'd open their, they'd crack open their shell just a little bit to let the water in and they'd filter it and then the water would come back out. And that was the exciting life of a brachiopod. Here's a, here's a Devonian brachiopod. Uh, this one is called Meteospirifer, and it kind of had these cool little wing tips. And um, they're very well preserved. Uh, this one is from up near um, Sylvania, Ohio. This is from a Devonian brachiopod called Paraspirifer. It's actually got a coating of fool's gold on it. I don't know if you can see that kind of yellowish coating that kind of sparkles a little bit. That's a uh, that's pyrite or fool's gold. It's an iron sulfide. And some brachiopods were relatively thin shelled, like this one. So you see how it's kind of paper thin, but that's actually two shells. One side of this brachiopod was concave and the other was convex and they kind of fit together. So this one is called Raffinesquina, and this is also found down near Cincinnati. So the next kind of fossil that's very common uh, that I wanted to talk about are bryozoans. And actually, I think some of the purple things in this, uh, in this diagram that Erica showed us before, um, they kind of look like corals are, are bryozoan colonies. Bryozoans built colonial uh, structures like corals, but they were very, very different uh, from corals. Uh, and they were individual tiny animals that were much, much smaller than the coral polyps. So generally, the if you look at a bryozoan, let's see, here's my bryozoans. So, so here is a rock with a bryozoan. This one is kind of a twiggy bryozoan. It had branching uh, uh, skeletal structure. And if you were to take a hand lens or a magnifying glass and look very closely, you'd see that there's teeny tiny holes in it. And inside of each one of those little teeny tiny holes was a little uh, bryozoan individual. Um, it's called a zoid. And the zooids had little tentacles and they would um, also 
uh, basically filter small particles of organic matter and plankton out of the water as it passed by. Some brines could actually generate currents with some hair-like cilia uh, that would actually create water currents that would um, bring the food to them. And bryozoans are kind of cool uh, because, I mean, a lot of fossil collectors don't get excited about bryozoans. Um, and that's partly because to identify them, a lot of bryozoans, you have to cut them open, polish them, make thin sections, and, um, and, and really know something about bryozoans. But bryozoans actually preserve a lot of fossils that um, where the original shell is dissolved. So this is an example of a bryozoan that overgrew a clam. And you've got here the outline of the clam and the, the original shell of the clam is gone. And the only reason we knew there was a clam there is because the bryozoan actually preserved it. So I think bryozoans can be pretty cool for that reason. So, hey Mark. yes. Do you have any examples of trace fossils? Um, Katie, our one viewer, asked if you uh, might be able to show those. I had a really good one last week. And let's see, I didn't I didn't bring that one, but I do have this one. And um, so this was a an animal that, that basically made a burrow and was probably sweeping around some kind of fleshy tentacle in search of food in the sediment. And a lot of trace fossils are things like, you know, worms that have like little tentacles that are sweeping. They have little burrows in the sediment and they're sweeping around uh, trying to collect food on a sticky tentacle. And then they pull the tentacle back into their burrow and they clean the food off of it. So, but I had some really cool uh, tracks and trails uh, last week with me. So the next fossil I'm going to talk about are corals. And, and first I want to talk about colonial corals. So colonial corals are uh, corals that basically share uh, a common skeleton, kind of like they're living in an apartment complex. But uh, there were multiple individual animals living uh, in close proximity. So here is a colonial coral. And um, you, you can see it goes all the way through here. And basically where, where you see these little dimples, um, each one of those was uh, where a single coralite, uh, so each one of those is a coralite, each one of those had a single coral polyp uh, that would uh, be something like an anemone with, you know, uh, fleshy stinging tentacles. So the tentacles don't usually get preserved as fossil, only the hard skeleton of the coral. If, if you look at the side of this one, you can actually, you can see these little platforms um, in the side and the coralites are like tubes and as the colony grew, the, uh, the coral animal would put little floors down. These are called tabulae. And it would put down new floors and it would just, the animal would only live in the upper part of the coralite, like the penthouse of, of the apartment building. So this is a polished coral. Uh, this one is called Hexogonaria. It's from the Devonian. And these have a special name up in northern Michigan. They call them Petoskey stones um, because up near Petoskey, Michigan, uh, they find these on the, on the beaches of Lake Michigan and they'll uh, polish them and sell them as souvenirs up there. But we can find these in Ohio too. So those are colonial corals, but sometimes we have corals that actually live uh, as solitary corals. And those have a, I mentioned them last week, they have the name horn corals. And that is um, mainly because farmers thought that they kind of looked like cow's horns. 
and um, and so these would have just a single coral animal uh, living at the top of the coralite. Uh, this one is from the Ordovician. This was called Gruinchia canadensis, and um, and then this is a um, one from the Mississippian. I don't know its its name, but you can see the growth rings on there where the coral kind of expanded and contracted and expanded and contracted. So those are horn corals. And then next I want to talk about cephalopods. So cephalopods, uh, modern cephalopods include your squids and octop octopuses, cuttlefish, and the chambered nautilus. And the chambered nautilus actually kind of resembles an ammonite. So here's the squid-like animal and it lived in the outer part of the shell. And I actually have a picture of the modern nautilus. You're probably familiar with this. So this guy's still living today and it's very similar to its uh, ancestors that lived nearly 500 million years ago. So here you can see the nautilus shell and I'll turn it this way. So if you see it has many, many chambers and as it grew, it would seal off additional chambers, but it would only live in this outermost chamber called the living chamber. And you notice there's a tube that connects all the chambers. This tube actually allowed the nautilus or allowed the nautiloids, their, their relatives are called, to control how much air was inside these chambers. So these were partially filled with fluid, with seawater and partially filled with air. And the nautilus could adjust the amount of air in the chambers and it could rise or sink in the water, just like a submarine without expending much energy. So that was a really cool uh, evolutionary um, uh, adaptation that the cephalopods had. Now, some cephalopods were coiled like, like this one, but other cephalopods were straight. So if you took the, the nautilus and you basically uncoiled it, um, you have you know the, the many chambers here. So starting with the oldest one and then uh, the most recent one would be on the on the big end in the living chamber. So those were those were called cephalopods. So I must mention this one because this is the group that I work on. So these are the crinoids and crinoids were related to your modern day sea stars, uh, sea cucumbers and brittle stars. And so here is a, a fossil, the, this is the uh, basically the crown part of a crinoid. It has the arms and the calyx. And then there'd be a stem attached to this that would root it to the seafloor. And I explained last week that crinoids are kind of like a starfish on a stick. So a starfish has the mouth on the bottom side. If you flip it upside down so that the mouth is now on the top and then you root it to the seafloor with the long stem, you'll have a crinoid. And I have a picture. So this is a crinoid uh, from the Devonian Columbus limestone. Uh, and this is part of a poster that we just released. Um, I worked with a graphic artist named Madison Perry and uh, to basically uh, illustrate some of the common fossils of the Columbus limestone, which are the ones that you would find down in the State House downtown Columbus. And some of them we actually drew living reconstructions uh, of the animals. Uh, so you don't typically find complete crinoids like this. Typically what you'll find are only the stem sections. But 
And the stems are sometimes look like a stack of Cheerios, kind of like like these guys here, uh, like a stack of checkers or Cheerios. And one way you can recognize them as echinoderms is that they have fivefold symmetry. And sometimes you can see this in the center of the stem. I don't know if you can see there's a little star shape in this one. So I, I like to I like it when I find this. Uh, that central area is where the nerves and, and some soft tissue would run through and um, and um, and and connect, you know, all the way down the stem. But crinoids were basically suspension feeders. They they had little sticky tube feet, and as the water would would flow past them, uh, they would collect little bits of plankton and little bits of organic matter from um, from the seawater. So those are some of the common uh, fossils and. Uh, next, I wanted to talk about a few of the biggest and baddest fossils that we find in Ohio. So one of my one of my favorite fossils are trilobites. And it so happens that since 1985, Ohio has had as its official state invertebrate fossil, uh, a large trilobite called Isotelus. And it's big. So this is a cast of an isotelus trilobite called Isotelus maximus. And this guy was found about a hundred years ago at the Huffman Dam when they were constructing the dam uh, for flood control in Dayton, Ohio. And this is the actual size of the trilobite. It's now in the Smithsonian Institute. But back in 1985, a group of elementary school children and their teacher lobbied the Ohio legislature to make this our official state invertebrate fossil. And so that legislation passed unanimously and Isotelus is now our official state fossil. So Isotelus trilobites were related, they were arthropods, so they were related to horseshoe crabs, uh, your insects and spiders, your shrimps, crabs and lobsters, and roly-polies. They could actually roll up like roly-polies, but they didn't always start off this big. So Isotelus is actually, uh, the genus Isotelus includes the largest trilobite ever found, that one was found up in northern Manitoba on uh, the shore of Hudson Bay. And we had already named this one Isotelus maximus. Um, iso means same and telus, uh, iso, same tail. So the head and the tail of this trilobite are about the same size. So that's what the genus name means. And maximus, well, because it was really, really big. So they discovered an even bigger one up in Canada, and uh, that one was 70 centimeters, which is about two feet long. So, you know, it's yet again a lot larger than this one. And they named that one Isotelus rex, um, which means king. So Isotelus is one of the biggest trellis, but they didn't always start off this big. So this one is a little rolled up isotelus. And um, so I'm holding it so you can see his, you can see his eyes are facing you. Um, and then here are his, I'll hold him sideways so you can see an eye here. And he's got his head here and his tail here. And then he's got some flexible segments here. So this guy could roll up like a pill bug. And I found this one at Caesar Creek State Park in Warren County. And in our final episode, I'll actually talk about Caesar Creek. And you can go there and find trilobites like Isotelus if you're if you're lucky. Um, 
So Isotelus lived, you know, probably a lot like a horseshoe crab. This is a modern uh, horseshoe crab. And these guys would actually partially bury in the uh, in the seafloor, and we think Isotelus may have done that. And on the underside, the salt, they had uh, an underside that had legs. And uh, these guys actually had, um, you know, little pinchers on the end of their legs. Uh, but these guys would basically scavenge for food in the sea bottom. And we think Isotelus was probably predatory. So it was probably looking for small worms and other arthropods and things in the seafloor. So probably lived a lot like a horseshoe crab. Also, Isotelus, in order to get from being very small to very big, it had to periodically molt its shell. And we think that the large Isotelus, they may have molted their shell something like 18 times uh, from when they first became miniature adults to when they reached their maximum size. And each time they would grow about 25% larger. So they would have a soft shell underneath their hard shell, and then they would be vulnerable for a little bit until their new shell hardened. So here is a Isotelus that uh, actually molted its shell. It's got these lines that go right through past the eyes. Um, these were weak parts of its shell. And what it would do is it would dig its spines into the sediment and then back out. And here it left its what we call the free cheeks. And you can see an eye here and an eye here. So these are basically molted parts of the Isotelus trilobite. And a lot of the fossils of Isotelus we find are in fact molts. Okay, so the next big bad fossil I wanna talk about uh, is also from the same part of the state as Isotelus. So that would be southwestern Ohio, and they're from the Ordovician period. And this is one that fewer people know about. This one is called a Eurypterid. So Eurypterids are also called fossil sea scorpions. And this is one, this fossil. So this is a cast of the original. But this was found in 1938 uh, down near Manchester in Adams County, Ohio. And it was in a uh, road construction project. And there was a University of Cincinnati student and he noticed he was working on the road crew and he noticed in the jaws of the steam shovel uh, that there was a large fossil. And so he rescued this, this fossil and he took it to a professor at the University of Cincinnati, uh, uh, Professor Castor. And um, Dr. Castor correctly identified this as part of a large sea scorpion. And they went back to the site and they found hundreds of specimens of this thing. And they were able to reconstruct the entire uh, uh, top part of the exoskeleton, which is, is what's usually preserved. And this is the reconstruction of Megalograptus, this giant sea scorpion that you can find down near Cincinnati. And this is actual size. So uh, somebody told me that it might actually be like a good, you know, like guitar size. Um, but yeah, Megalograptus uh, would have been, you know, kind of scary. Um, and he had a very sharp, you know, pointed tail called a telson. And uh, he had some wicked looking appendages. We think that these large appendages, which were kind of special to Megalograptus, that they might have raked the seafloor with these large appendages in search of in search of prey. And I have a picture. There's a reconstruction of the underside of Vagalograptus. Uh, 
And it's probably a little bit hard to see, but right up here near the top, uh, it had a pair of pinchers. So these were uh, called chelicery. And this kind of really told us, you know, the kinds of arthropods that these guys are related to. And another arthropod with chelicery are your uh, arachnids, which include your ticks and spiders, uh, your scorpions, and again, our friend, the horseshoe crab. So he has uh, a pair right here, the little pair near the mouth. So this is what they would use these pinchers for is they would tear flesh from their prey and they would um, uh, they would just basically be shredding it. So they're not like eating things whole. Now we know that Megalograptus, uh, you know, was a predator. And we actually have what's called a coprolite that was found in association with Megalograptus. And a coprolite is basically fossil dung. So it's the waste matter that, you know, was excreted out uh, after the uh, uh, Megalograptus had done its eating. And inside this coprolite, we actually found pieces of other Eurypterids and pieces of Isotelus. And this told us that these guys were probably cannibalistic. They were probably eating other Megalograptus. And if you, if you study modern arachnids, uh, like uh, spiders, uh, a lot of times the females will actually eat the males after they're done mating. And it's quite possible that Eurypterids did this as well. Uh, but they likely also preyed on our, our friend Isotelus. Hey, Mark. Yes. Um, we have a question from Carrie. She's wondering, could the scorpions be related to modern day lobsters? They are distant. Yes, they are distantly related. So they're, they're, they're arthropods, but very, very, very distant cousins. <laughs> but that's a good observation. So, um, so the final big bad fossil that I want to talk about is the one that's been sitting behind me uh, for the last two uh, episodes of our webinar, and that is Dunkleosteus. Now, Dunkleosteus. This is uh, how it's spelled: Dunkleosteus. Uh, Teroli. So the name is uh, is for uh, Professor David Dunkel, who was a paleontologist uh, who was affiliated for a while with the Cleveland Museum, and he actually uh, studied uh, these uh, placoderms, which are armored uh, fishes. And Dunkleosteus is is one of the biggest, baddest of the armored fishes that lived during the Devonian period. Uh, that one behind me is actually life size. And we think that if you were to um, uh, extrapolate the body of Dunkleosteus, that um, you know, it would have looked something like this, but it would have been about 29, up to 29 feet long. So I have here, this is a, a, a reconstruction of Dunkleosteus uh, uh, by an artist um, from Metazoa Studios named uh, Hugo Zeles. And so here's his reconstruction of Dunkleosteus. And then we added a fisherman and a boat. Of course, these didn't live at the same time, but just to give you an idea of how big Dunkleosteus was. So Dunkleosteus, what we find as a fossil is only the armored front portion uh, that's shown here in silver. So the rest of this was probably cartilage and is not typically preserved as fossils, although we do have a few fossils from that part. But mainly what we have are these front parts. 
And sometimes these are actually preserved in those concretions that Erica was telling us about that you find in the Ohio black shales. So these are carbonate concretions. They're harder than the surrounding shell. And so they tend to erode out. And this is a small one. I mean, some of these guys are six to eight feet in diameter. And if you crack them open or let them break naturally, very frequently, well, I should say infrequently, actually, uh, they have a recognizable fossil at their center. Uh, but probably most of them formed around a nucleus of some sort of, of fossil originally. It just, it may have been a very small organic bit that didn't preserve. Um, so this is the jawbone of Dunkleosteus, and you can see this is where it would have fit in. And this is actually not even quite maximum size. They, they got even bigger than this. But one thing you'll notice that is missing from this jawbone that is, say, present in this one, this is a bony fish. Uh, and there are teeth in this one, but Dunkleosteus didn't have any teeth. So how did he, he was a predator, how did he, how did he eat? Well, he actually had exposed sharp bone here, and the lower jaw uh, would actually rub against the bone on the upper jaw, and these would be like self-sharpening scissors. So even though he didn't have any teeth, he could shear right through, you know, say, you know, a human being, if there were human beings back then, but there weren't. So there were sharks and other placoderms and some invertebrates that Dunkleosteus may have eaten. So, and the cool thing about some of our fossils is they're well known outside of Ohio. So we have here a Dunkleosteus. This one is a, a plush Dunkleosteus, uh, available from uh, from uh, PRI, that's Paleontological Research Institute, and um, they make a Dunkleosteus, and they just came out with, voila, Isotelus. So uh, we've got two fossils from Ohio that uh, are have their own. Uh, plush toy. So I think that's pretty cool. So does any anybody have questions about any of Ohio's marine fossils? Um, Mark, uh, somebody asked, why are there so many fossils in Cincinnati compared to the rest of the state? Yeah, Cincinnati is actually world famous for its fossils. Um, the, the first time um, I went to Europe, I was actually delighted uh, to see fossils from Maysville, Kentucky, uh, which is just across the river uh, from uh, Ohio and uh, Cincinnati area uh, in museums in Paris and London and in Germany. Um, so Cincinnati was, uh, first of all, it had the right environment. So it was a warm, you know, it was a subtropical uh, sea, maybe kind of like the Bahamas. So there were lots of animals living on the, the bottom of this shallow sea. Um, it, the fossils uh, were never buried very deeply. So they always stayed pretty close to the surface. So uh, they were not metamorphosed by, you know, the heat and pressure that uh, results from being buried under a, a big weight of a, a rock column. So they always stayed near the surface, so they, they were very well preserved. Um, there's lots of hills in Cincinnati, and uh, so there's lots of exposures. So there's road cuts and stream cuts, and the fossils are also in those shales that Erica was talking about that Basically, when it rains, those shales will kind of turn back into clay and the fossils will be kind of perfectly eroded out. And the limestones uh, that you also find in that area are, tend to be thinner bedded limestones uh, and they alternate with shales. So 
every winter when there's like freezing and thawing, uh, those limestones basically just slip out of the uh, outcrops and they are replenished. Whereas if you have more massive limestones like we have here in Columbus, uh, the fossils, uh, the, the rock erodes more slowly, the rock tends to stay in place, and the fossils erode about the same rate as the rock. So they tend to be kind of beat up when you find them. Even, but Columbus actually, the Columbus limestone is rich with fossils. It's just, they're very hard to collect and there aren't as many exposures. Um, okay, Lori wants to know, would you say there's pockets of fossil rich areas in Ohio? And second part of, it's kind of a two part question. And what fossils in Ohio are the most collectible or in other words, the most rare? I can, if you want to tackle um, the first one, I'll, I can repeat the second one in a bit. So would you say there's pockets of fossil rich areas in Ohio? There are, I mean, there are, um, there are fossil, what we call fossil Lagerstätte. It's a, a borrow a German word. It just means fossil deposit places. Um, and some of them have exceptional preservation, um, like the uh, Lytton uh, coal mine that uh, I think Chris Wright and uh, Tyler Norris will talk about in uh, maybe in next week's episode. Uh, but there are other places like uh, near Sylvania, Ohio, we have uh, the silica formation, which is just again, a very, very fossil rich uh, formation. Unfortunately, that one is only exposed uh, in Ohio in quarries. And uh, you know, the quarry owners uh, don't let people go in and collect because quarries are dangerous uh, places. And um, so there aren't as many natural exposures, but there's a wonderful uh, uh, treasure trove of fossils from up at the silica shale. Uh, the Columbus limestone I mentioned uh, is exposed here in central Ohio, and that is the subject of our, again, our, our poster here. And there aren't a lot of, you can, there are some places along the Scioto River where you might be able to pick up some Columbus limestone fossils, uh, but you can view them um, in the uh, state house at the Capitol downtown. So uh, if you uh, go down there twice a year, we offer tours of the fossils of the Columbus State House. And these are the kind of fossils uh, that you will find there. And um, we are actually uh, developing a guide to the fossils of the State House that should be available uh, very soon, hopefully later this year. Hey, uh, uh, Erica, is there something that you wanted to clarify? Um while Mark had that poster up? Yeah, so um, we had a question from Lori um, earlier asking if the circular part of horn cor corals were, was the base of them. And Mark, I know you have a, an example of a living horn coral on that poster, correct? So I figured you could you could show that. And that was actually, the circular part's actually the top of the horn coral. Well, sometimes what happens is that um, the horn corals get sheared off so you might have a cut through the horn coral. And if you have a cut that goes this way, it'll look circular. But what you should see are these, uh, what we call septa, which are little divisions that um, within the skeleton that radiate from the center out to the outer wall. So if you see these look like little pie slices, uh, in your circular rock, then you might have a horn coral. Some other things that could be circular in cross section are your, you know, your cephalopods had cone shaped shells. So if you cut them short ways across like this, they would be circular. And the other possibility would be uh, your crinoid stems. So uh, again, if you have these, this is what a stack of the individual stem pieces looks like. But if you're looking at it 
a, a section that cuts across one of these, it'll look circular too. If you do see a, a, a hole in the middle like this, about the same size, uh, or if you see like little star shaped or flower shaped uh, 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 center, then you're probably looking at a crinoid. And again, if you send those in to us, we might be able to help identify those. Um, I think there was also a question about collectible fossils. And, yeah. Um, oh. So it was what fossils in Ohio are the most collectible or in other words, most rare? Well, those are not always the same thing. Uh, rarity can add to the desirability of a fossil, but some fossils might be quite rare and no one is really interested in them. Um, so the, the poor bryozoans that I mentioned before, uh, you know, they're all over the place and, and nobody appreciates them. Uh, people seem to like things that had eyes. Uh, so things like, you know, your trilobites. Here's a here's a small isotelus uh, trilobite. And this guy, you know, he was interesting because, you know, he had eyes and he moved around and uh, he kind of looks like a wicked bug. So people like things like trilobites. Uh, they also like, you know, big predators. Um, uh, things like Dunkleosteus and and things like, you know, these these fish fossils uh, that had teeth and, you know, were predators and yeah, I think I think people they tend to like the predators. They tend to like things with eyes. Cool. And um, a lot of people are are asking if this will be archived or available for later viewing. So I just want to mention that yes, it will be. Um, we're having a little bit of issues uploading large videos right now, but we have um, a YouTube channel at Ohio DNR. Uh, so it'll be available there and the Ohio Geological Survey um, Facebook page will post when that's available. So thanks for those questions. And then we, oh, and that is the number uh, to the Geologic Records Center that Mark is holding up, 614-265-6576. And um, that's where you can get the poster that he, that he has shown. Um, and a bunch of other cool resources. Uh, I don't know who wants to, to take this question, um, Erica or Mark, but uh, we were asked, can you find um, ammonites in trilobites? And I'm not sure that I pronounced <laughs> that correctly, but um, okay. <laughs> um, but can you find those here in Ohio? I think we touched on the, the trilobites, but who wants to take that one? I, I can take it. Um, okay. So yes, uh, well, the answer to the trilobites is definitely. Um, in the Cincinnati area alone, there's about a dozen species or so that you can find. And uh, there's probably close to 100 species that can be found in all of the different uh, geologic time periods from Ohio. The question about ammonites is a little bit trickier because technically ammonites only lived during the Mesozoic era. That was the era when the when the dinosaurs lived. And as Erica correctly mentioned, we probably may well have had dinosaurs walking around in Ohio at that time because we were above sea level. We just don't have any rock record from that time period. However, we do have ammonoids which are the coiled cephalopods uh, like this guy here. We have a lot of these in Ohio. So, and people sometimes call these uh, ammonites, even though that's not technically correct, they should be called ammonoids. But we had a lot of these in Ohio. Uh, so they're just not technically ammonites. Where is the place in Ohio that fossils are most abundant? Is that the Cincinnati area? Yes, uh, I, I'd say that the combination of factors I mentioned earlier, you know, the lots of natural exposures, well-preserved fossils that erode out of the rock, 
that that's easily the best place to collect fossils in Ohio. But we'll mention a few more places in our final uh, webinar. Uh, there's, uh, like I said, here in central Ohio is, is a pretty good place, um, but there are places all over the western part of the state where they're abundant. Um, there's a, a park in uh, uh, called Oaks Quarry in, 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 in uh, Fairborn, Ohio, uh, which is a, a little north of Dayton, that is a, is a good place to see some Silurian fossils um, in the Brassfield limestone. So those are some good places. OK, um, well, it's about time to wrap up. Do you guys have any other parting words before we leave, Erica, Mark, or Chuck? No. Well, I was just going to say, don't forget to check out your gravel driveway because chances are you'll find some fossils in it. That is awesome. Um, and next week topic, next week's topic is um, Ohio's ancient plants and animals. So this week we covered marine fossils. Next week we're going to um, go on to those land animals that came a little later on in history. So hope you join us for next week's um, Ohio Rocks Talks. And um, thank you thank you all for the, the questions. It's been awesome. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Erica and Chuck. And we'll see you all next week. Awesome. Thank all you. Right. All right. Bye.